I just want to say, I think this is James's fourth visit to PNP or something like that. Anyway, we love having him. Um, is it, was, uh, you may know that his uh, early part of his career was a journalist uh, for The Globe uh, in Boston, The Washington Post right here, and other publications he's contributed to over the years. Today, he is uh, best known as a world-class author and a world-class musician, as well as an award-winning composer and teacher. And I just want to say, was anybody here for his last event here Absolutely. for the good Lord? <laughs> yeah, I know you were. Veronica, I know you were. I'm sure you were. Um, I, and if those of you who are lucky enough to be here, uh, he brought his band. Um, they played in, interspersed with reading from the book. They were amazing. They were incredible. And I think I really have to say that it was, without a doubt, probably the best event we've ever had in this store. Um, the customers who came and it, you know, it was packed did not walk out of here. They floated out of here. And in fact, I overheard one person say, that wasn't an author talk. That was a spiritual experience. <laughs> so we will never forget it here at, at Politics and Prose and James. We really appreciate that uh, you did that and, and uh, brought those guys with you that time. So that was for his third novel, The Good Lord Bird, which of course went on to win the 2013 National Book Award. Followed two other best-selling novels, Sung Yet, Song Yet Sung and Miracle at St. Anna. James also writes nonfiction. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read his beautiful memoir, The Color of Water, which reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Tonight, he'll be reading from his new book. It's called Kill Him and Leave, Searching for James Brown and the American Soul. And in this book, I was thinking about this earlier, it sort of intertwines two of his greatest passions and talents, uh, writing and music. Um, he plums the life of legendary soul singer James Brown. But to call Kill Him and Leave a biography, I think kind of sells it uh, short. Um, James seeks to understand a man who lived in the public eye, a man capable of towering talent and generosity, who nonetheless spent most of his life trying to remain private uh, and unknowable. And for the most part, James Brown succeeded in hiding uh, his interior self, even from his closest family, friends, and associates. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, those of us who are willing to date ourselves and admit how old we are, um, and who grew up listening to soul music in the 60s. You know, James Brown obviously was the godfather of soul. He was the musical father of black pride. He did, let's face it, let's be honest, he did his own version of the Moonwalk way before Michael Jackson in high heel boots. Um, he did the splits before Michael Jackson. Um, he had those faux fainting spells, the cape, right? Um, and he would always have that call out to, to Maceo in Cold Sweat Part One. So. Um, you know, this is what we all grew up with and what at least I know I remember. Um, he was such a dominant and unique figure in, in American popular culture and obviously in the music of that era. Uh, he had, uh, James uh, contends, this James contends, um, as profound an influence on American social history as Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass, but as we all, uh, I think, at least know superficially, much of his reputation and legacy became tangled up in unflattering impressions and tragic incidents from his life, too often leaving him marked and misinterpreted as more of a simple caricature than the complicated cultural icon that he truly was. Uh, a recent review called Kill Him and Leave a Furious Ode, part appreciation and part biography, and I, I think one of the things I love most about the book is that there is actually a lot of James in it, James McBride in it. Um, and I was thinking that, you know, books and music, what do they have in common? I think like um, notes in a great musical score, uh, this book, um, you'll find the words rise and fall. They're raucous, they're gentle, they're sweet, they're sour. And you know, in the end, they really do unearth a deeper set of emotions and thoughts and ideas about uh, James Brown's life and also the life of our country. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming James McBride back to Politics and Prose. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so nice to see so many white, I mean, nice people here today. I really feel like. <laughs> just, uh, just such a nice thing. I, uh, hey, I said that the last time, but it, it, it always works. I don't know why. Um, I am uh, delighted to be back here. This is like being at the hometown. It's like being in, the, you know, in, in front of the home crowd. I have so many good friends from Washington, D.C. who are here, and I'm so happy to see them. and. So happy to see you know all of you and um, and I thank you for uh, for coming out and mostly thank you for supporting this bookstore because independent bookstores are really the last line of reason and discourse in a country that is you know seems to be going quite mad so so 
So thank you for supporting Politics and Pros. You won't find another place like it. Don't let the place go. Don't, you know, you can order your book somewhere else in another country, but in this country, <laughs> get in your car and come down to Politics and Pros. They have different sites now. They bonded with some other outfit. Just Politics and Pros is what you're going to do. In any case, um, <clears throat> I'll just start by reading. I'm going to read for the next five or six hours, and then after I'm done, <laughs> we'll uh, have a Q&A, you know, true and false. And then, uh, and then you'll buy books, and that's it, and I'll go home. Um, I'll start by reading some from the book, and then I'll talk. And then um, after I finish talking, you'll be, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have and comments and editorials. <coughs> and whatever you want to do. This is a place for, you know, this is your night. Have a good time. You came here in the rain, and I, I, <coughs> I want you to leave here satisfied that you have been fully entertained and 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 uh, and uh, informed about the life of uh, the one of the greatest, <coughs> so one of the greatest uh, musicians and and illuminators in American history. This begins. This book begins. Well, let me just begin by saying. I went to Ob I studied jazz at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, and when I was at school, studied with Deanna's brother, John Jang. In fact, it's funny, you know, John Jang, who was Chinese, introduced me to Thelonious Monk, so that shows you how, you know, that's how stupid I was. But <coughs> um, John Jang's a composer, who a fellow, gra fellow graduate of Oberlin. But <coughs> at Oberlin, Oberlin has a wonderful jazz department now. But when I was there, there was no jazz department. There were like five or six very serious jazz students. Among them, a young Chinese guy from San Francisco named John Jang, whose sister is here, and a few others. Michael Philip Mossman, who are now arranges for the Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon Jazz, Carnegie Mellon Jazz Orchestra. I mean, Carnegie Hall Jazz Orchestra. Fred Nelson, who is the musical director for Aretha Franklin now. We were all serious, very serious music students, but we were jazz students. Now, Oberlin at the time, now they have a great jazz department now. My son is, he goes to Oberlin, he studies jazz, and he's, you know, they have some wonderful musicians, and I'm so grateful for my Oberlin education. And if you have a kid, send him to Oberlin. <laughs> <coughs> but at the time, this is in the 70s, they had not come into the modern world with regard to jazz. It was one of the most embarrassing features of the school at the time. Um, but they had one teacher who taught jazz, and his name was Wendell Logan. His name was Professor Wendell Logan. He was a black guy, he was from the South. And uh, if you wanted to learn jazz trumpet, you went to Professor Logan. If you wanted to learn jazz saxophone, Professor Logan was the guy. If you wanted to learn jazz piano, jazz arranging, jazz history, that would be Professor Logan, Professor <laughs> Logan, Professor Logan. <coughs> well, he, his high level jazz arranging course he taught, and I took it with my best friend, whose name was Leander Bean. Leander was and is a classical pianist. He lives here in the Washington, D.C. area. But at the time, Leander was, Leander was a classically trained classical player. He didn't play jazz, but he took the jazz arranging course because he loved jazz. And part of that course, you had to write out these like three-part arrangements, and then you played them. You know, the students would play them, and then after the end of that, at the midterm, Wendell would give you a grade because that, that showed your progress in terms of learning his harmonic you know, the technical things that he showed you during the course of the, of the semester. Well, he gave, well, when, after we had our midterm, he gave Leander an A. And then I got my midterm back, and it was a big C on the page. <laughs> so I waited till the class emptied, and then I said, uh, and I waited till Leander, and everybody walked out, and then I walked up to Professor Logan, who was standing in front of the class, and I said, you know, I said, you know Professor Logan, I said, um, like, you gave, you know, like, Leander an A, you know, and you gave me a C, you know, I mean, you know, me and you, and I get a C, and you know, <laughs> African American music. And, <laughs> and he was sitting there, he looked, and he went like this. <laughs> and he said, I gave Leander an A because he earned it. And I gave you a C, and you just earned a D. <laughs> he said, Don't ever come into my room and talk to me like that. He said, This music is not about race, this music is about the truth. And if you are not about the truth, you are not qualified to play any kind of music. I never forgot that. And so that's the first thing you see in this book. The book is dedicated to Professor Logan, who died in 2010. We had a big concert at Oberlin when they opened up the new jazz facility. John Jang was there. Some of the great musicians that studied under him came back after 30 or 40 years to have a big concert with Stevie Wonder. 
and the book is dedicated to Professor Logan, and it begins with, if you're not about the truth, you're not qualified to play any kind of music. Um, so <clears throat> the book begins. I'll read to you from chapter one, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll proceed. <clears throat> Back in the 1960s, when I was a kid living in St. Albans, Queens, in New York City, there was a huge forbidding black and gray house that sat on a lovely street not far from my home. The house was located across a set of Long Island Railroad tracks that basically split my neighborhood in half. My side of the tracks was the poor side, tightly clumped, small, exhausted-looking homes, some with neat lawns and manicured flowered beds, others like mine in total disarray. The neighbor was mostly working-class blacks, post office, and city transit workers from America's South who had moved to the relative bliss of Queens from the crowded funk of Harlem, uh, Bronx, and Brooklyn. It was a proud crowd. We had moved up. We were living the American dream. But on the other side of the railroad tracks, that was the high life. Big, sumptuous homes with luscious lawns, long, shiny Cadillacs that eased down smooth, silent streets, a gigantic all-glass church, a beautiful park, and a glistening brand-new steak-and-take diner run by the Nation of Islam that stayed open 24 hours on weekends. The Nation scared the crap out of everybody in my neighborhood back in those days, by the way. Not even the worst, most desperate junkie would stalk, would stalk into a stake and take and pull out his heater. He'd be dead before he hit the door. <laughs> Many of the Nation of Islam Muslims who worked in stake and take were ex-cons, serious, easygoing men in clean white shirts and bow ties who warned you about the ills of pork as they served you all the cheese steaks you wanted. <laughs> that place was smooth business. And then there were the celebs who had brought homes nearby, Roy Campanella, Lena Horne, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Fats Waller, Milt Hinton, all stars, all big time. But none of them lived in the huge forbidding house on Murdoch Avenue with vines creeping onto the spiral roof and a moat that crossed a small built-in stream with a black Santa Claus illuminated at Christmas and a black awning that swooped down from the, from the front yard in the shape of a wild hairdo. None of them was James Brown. We used to stand out his house and dream, just stand outside, me and my best friend Billy Smith. Sometimes crowds of us would stand around, kids from my neighborhood, kids from other neighborhoods. A kid from nearby Hollis named Al Sharpton used to stand out there sometimes, but I didn't know him in those days. The rumor was, and this went on for years, that the godfather of soul would slip out of his house at night, walk around the corner to nearby Addisley Park, sit down and talk to the kids and just give out money. Give it out by the 20s and 50s. If you promised him, you'd stay in school. <laughs> we hung out in the park and waited and waited. <laughs> we waited for months, all summer, all winter, our promises ready. He never showed. I knew of no one in my neighborhood who actually met the great man until my sister Dottie, age 11, fell into our house one afternoon, breathless, sweaty, and screaming, Oh my God, oh my God, you won't believe it. Helen, oh my God. Helen, the sister above Dottie in age and Dot's guru in those days, came running and the rest of us gathered around and it took several minutes for Dottie to compose herself and finally she blurted out her story. She and her best friend, Shelley Cleveland, had slipped across the railroad tracks to linger outside James, Brown house, James Brown's house after school like all the kids, and of course he didn't come out. But that afternoon, Dottie and Shelley decided to do something no kid in my neighborhood, no kid in New York City, no kid in the world that I knew of at that point in my eight-year-old life had ever done or thought to do. They went up to the front door and knocked. <laughs> A white maid answered. She said, what do you want? Can we speak to Mr. Brown, Dottie asked. A few minutes later, James Brown himself appeared at the door with two white women, one on each arm, both dressed in 60s wear, complete with beehive hairdos. Dottie and Shelley nearly fainted. The godfather of soul seemed tickled. He greeted them warmly and he asked Dottie, what's your name? Dottie, stay in school, Dottie. Don't be no fool. He shook her hand and shook Shelley's hands and the two girls fled. We listened, breathless, as Dottie recounted it. It seemed unbelievable. Even my mother was impressed. See that, she barked. Listen to James Brown. Stay in school. <laughs> but who cared about what she said? What was important was that James Brown said it. Dottie's star soared. She had always been a total James Brown fanatic, but in a house of 12 kids where food was scarce and attention was scarcer, 
where ownership of the latest James Brown 45 RPM was like owning the Holy Grail. Dottie morphed from underling to holding a special kind of status. Ambassador to famedom, chosen member of the tribe, a button man, a made member of the mob. In other words, a big kid with gold star standing. The shine lasted months. She would stand in our freezing living room on cold winter nights when there was nothing to eat and nowhere to go and no money to go there anyway and play out the scenario. He's so small, she declared. He's a little guy. She'd leap up and whip her hair back in James Brown style and thrust out her jaw and holler in a southern accent, stay in school, daddy. Don't be no fool. <laughs> ha! We howled. Visitors, neighbors, even my gruff stepfather and the serious people from church asked her to relive the moment, which she did giving a blow-by-blow -blow account of how the hardest working man in show business, Mr. Dynamite himself, had come to the door of his house and given it to her straight. Stay in school, Dottie. Ha! The grumpy old folks in church listened and nodded, stern approval. James Brown was right. Stay in school, Dottie. And I watched all this in grim silence. My crummy sister had beat me to the punch. <laughs> she had kissed the black stone. She'd met James Brown and my jealously lasted for years. Every man or woman in this life has a song, and if you're lucky, you can remember it. The song of your wedding, the song of your first love, the song of your childhood. For African Americans, the song of our life, the song of our entire history, is embodied in the life and times of James Brown. He is easily one of the most famous African Americans in the world, and arguably the most influential African American in pop music history. His picture hangs on the walls of African homes and huts where people don't even know what he did for a living. His imprint has been felt throughout Western Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Far East. His dances, his language, his music, his style, his pioneering funk, his manner of speaking are stamped into the American consciousness as deeply as that of any civil rights leader or sports hero, including Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. He is also arguably the most misunderstood and misrepresented African-American figure of the last 300 years. And I would speculate that it is nearly as important and as influential in American social history as, say, Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass. When his 2006 funeral procession steered slowly through Harlem, men rushed out of barbershops with shaving creams on their faces. Children stayed home from school. Old people wept openly. The Apollo Theater crowds lined the street for five city blocks, thousands of people, from 125th Street up to 130th Street. Black America, from front to back, took a knee and bowed. The king of pop himself, Michael Jackson, flew to Augusta for the funeral service, a coronation from a king to a king. Black Americans loved Michael too, but while he was black America's child, abandoned at times, forsaken, adopted again, in, out, black, white, not sure, there was no question about who James Brown was. James Brown was our soul. He was unquestionably black, unquestionably proud, unquestionably a man. He was real and he was funny. He was the uncle from down south who shows up at your house, gets drunk, takes out his teeth, embarrasses you in front of your friends and grunts, stay in school. <laughs> but you love him and you know he loves you. But there is more and here is where the story grows extra body parts. During the course of his 45 year career, James Brown sold more than 200 million records, recorded 321 albums, 16 of them hits, wrote 832 songs and made 45 gold records. He revolutionized Mer American music. He was the very first to fuse jazz into popular funk, the very first to record a live album that became a number one record. His influence created several categories of music now tabulated by Billboard, Variety, Downbeat, and Rolling Stone. He sang with everyone from hip-hop creator Africa Mbada to Pavarotti to pioneer jazz arranger Oliver Nelson. His band was revolutionary. It was made up of outstanding players and vocalists among the best in popular music this nation has ever produced. <clears throat> to the music world, he was an odd appendage, a kind of freak, a large rock in the road that you couldn't get around, a clown, a black category. He was a super talent, a great dancer, a real show, a laugher, a drug addict, a troublemaker, all hair and teeth, a guy who couldn't stay out of trouble. The man simply defied description. During the course of his life, James Brown never once made the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. And so that begins, uh, that begins this book. And the reason why I wrote this book, in addition to needing, you know, El Dinero, <laughs> La Mula, was, you know, was because um, uh, when, I, when I started researching the book, I realized that there were, I don't read many biographies, and most of the biographies I read, I end up 
like flipping to the end to see how the guy died and then that you know because I just you know the whole linear approach that you know he he wrote this and then he did this song and he wrote this it doesn't really tell me much about the con contextual framework of that person's life because I don't know you know I, you know there's a this there's presenting an artist when they're at the top of their game pulling out guns and shooting and carrying on and then there's presenting an artist that presents the framework that created them when they were in their weaning and important years. And so I went back to the weaning and important years of James Brown's life and I discovered that there's an enormous amount of fiction that's involved with James Brown's life. So I'll give you the, this is the Hollywood version of James Brown's life. He was born in a shack. You know, he, he was born by the river in a little tent, just like the river drawn out ever since. And then he became a rich man, and then he was just crazy, and then he died, and he just did drugs, and they all do that, and that's the end. The true facts of James Brown's life are this. He was born in, in Barnwell County, and he was raised by his mother and his father until his parents broke up. How his parents broke up is really not quite clear. But the closest I could come to it was that his father and his mother got into a big fight. His father pulled out a gun. And he didn't shoot at the mother. He just pulled out the gun and the mother started running and she never stopped till she got to New York. Now, if you saw the movie, you saw his mother presented later in the movie as a drunk who, you know, bums $100 for him at the Apollo, at the Apollo Theater. That, I have never found that to be true. The truth is that when James Brown did see his mother later in life, he took her back to his house and moved her in his house with his father hoping that his parents would reunite. When that didn't work, he took care of his mother until she died in a nursing home and practically rebuilt the whole nursing home. He gave them so much money. That's the truth of it. So, and, and portraying her as like a kind of prostitute in the city of Augusta was just, in my opinion, in my professional opinion, an absolute lie. But that's part of the James Brown. That's why James Brown's life is a kind of a metaphor for how we deal with storytelling and how we deal with each other. It's easy to present this Horatio Algier story. He was very poor and he became very rich. Poverty is a very complicated thing. For one thing, poverty is very loud. I mean, it's full of, you know, you know, inappropriate sex and no privacy and all sorts of mental problems that happen and they play themselves out in all kinds of weird ways. And it's just not, you know, it's not a simple thing that can be described in a sort of biopic where the guy does this and he does that and it, it just doesn't work that way. After J James Brown was actually raised by his father and an extended family that lived in the town of Ellington, South Carolina, which it's just a town that no longer exists. Because in 1951, the New US, New uh, U.S. Atomic Commission and General Electric and the DuPont Company decided to select 310 square miles of land in, J in South Carolina and build the largest bomb, nuclear bomb making facility in the world. It was 1951. It was the Cold War, and they just took this land. They just, you know, South Carolina in those days was run basically by four people, three state senators and a, and a governor, and they just did whatever they wanted. They moved all these people out, 8,000 people, six towns, including Dunbar and Ellington, um, and, and four others. And this is where James Brown's family was based. His, his great-grandfather had escaped to South Carolina from, from, uh, from Georgia, having worked in a prison gang, jumped in the Savannah River, swam over, and got to South Carolina where he was safe because, you know, the South Carolinians and the Georgians didn't get along. And they don't care where that Negro came from. You know, he probably was so they... And that's how James Brown's family got started. Um, he was eventually taken to Augusta where he lived with his great aunt and uh, who supposedly had a whorehouse, which I, I, m my guess is that it was not exactly a whorehouse. I'm, and I say that based on my own experience because if those who read The Color of Water know that I was sent to Kentucky when I was 15 years old and spent four summers in Kentucky. And I saw lots of places that you could call whorehouses. But they also did other stuff. They sold tin. They ran card games. Some of them worked as maids for white folks. It was, you know, you, you can, these labels that, I'm about done really with the depiction of historical black life as like big, you know, black women being big fat mamas who run around saying, you know, you special boy and God's gonna, I mean, I'm just tired of the suit. I'm just done with it. <laughs> the, <clears throat> I mean, are black, aren't black women shy too? Don't some read science books? I mean, you know, some of them don't, are allergic to asparagus and, you know, don't eat peanuts. I mean, can we get past, you know? So a lot of the, the versions of James Brown life, James Brown's life are fiction. And some of that fiction James Brown served up himself because he felt like, you know, white folks didn't care anyway. It didn't matter what you told them. As long as you can sing and dance and they're buying tickets, what does, difference does it make? 
And that worked perfectly, that, that, that dovetailed perfectly into the sort of world of show business where, you know, I mean, the entertainment press is not known for its Mike Wallace investigative 60 Minutes type of, <laughs> so a lot of James Brown's story is not really, not really accurate. And I tried to, you know, portray it as accurately as possible. The town with that, where his family was born, Ellington, South Carolina, Dunbarton, South Carolina, Williston, they were all, remo all, everyone was moved away. The white p folks who happened to have homes, the working class whites, because it was all working class people, they, their homes were, they could either have their homes picked up and moved, or they could have their home, they were, they, they were paid for their homes. But the majority of people who lived in these, this place were blacks. And these, most of these blacks were sharecroppers. And they were scattered to the four winds. And that business of displacement is really part of James Brown's story. And so when he sings with such power and such you know, gorgeousness that makes you want to get up on the floor and dance, he's singing from a different place. He's singing from a sense of displacement, a sense of powerlessness, and a sense of straight up and down fear. Because from the time he was a boy until the time he was, a, till the time he was, till he died, James Brown was was afraid of the government. Well, he'd been clean to the wall, clean to the walls by the IRS twice, but at the end of his life, even at the end of his life, in part because of what happened to his father and his 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 great aunts and all of his extended relatives when they were moved out of Ellington, along with all the white folks, was because the government didn't even need to come into your house to ask you. All they needed to just come in the house and hang their hat, and it was time for you to leave. He was always afraid that the government would take back what he. In fact, before he died, he, when he died, he lived in Barnwell County, South Carolina, within sight of the Savannah River nuclear site, which is still there. And they have these giant towers that reach up into the sky, big towers. They blink. You can see them all the way from Augusta. And he used to stand out on his porch, and he would, talk, he would tell Mr. Charles Bobbitt, who was his manager and his friend for 41 years, he'd say, you see those towers, Mr. Bobbitt? He said, that's the government. That's the government. It's li they're listening to me. They can, they can listen through my teeth. He had, you know, by then he was losing. He was so paranoid and so lonely and losing it so much that he felt that the government was listening to him through his teeth. And <clears throat> so that the early part of his life he spent in Barnwell County, then, then Augusta, and then he was busted at 16 for stealing car parts. Or something. He got a s sentence of like 13 years, something really ridiculous. And he served three years and a day in Tocoa Reformatory School, which was a reformatory school for, um, for juveniles. He came out of Tocoa, he came out of the, the, the juvenile facility, and he stayed in Tacoma because he had to stay in the area. And that's where he met Bobby Bird, and, the, the, and which became the Famous Flames. Now, in the movie, and in, in many of the printed versions, James Brown is depicted as coming out of, of um, prison and then getting signed out by Bobby Bird's grandmother or someone else, and then living in Bobby Bird's basement while he did his first hit, Please, 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 and so forth. But the math and the numbers don't, you know, and his first wife, who I interviewed in this book, tell a different story. He came out in 1951. He didn't, and please, 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 hit 1955. He didn't spend four years in Bird's Basement. I don't know that he spent more than a week or two in Bird's Basement. James Brown was married. He had a family. He had a wife and two kids, and they had a house. And as Miss Velma describes in this book, no man of hers is going to live in anybody's basement. She married, he married well. Because when he came out of prison, nobody in Tacoa wanted to be bothered with him. They called him convict. He was, a, he was an ex-convict in a town when, when nobody, even the black folks, really wanted to be bothered with him too much. She married him. Her father didn't like him at all. And it's funny because even she saw as he began to, as he began to, to become famous, she saw that he had, no, he had no chance of being successful in Tacoa. She saw that she had to let him go. And she did let him go. And the fact of the matter is, when he left her, when they divorced, she told him, I don't, you know, I don't need you to take care of me, but I have these two boys, and they need a place to live. And James Brown bought a piece of land, and he bought her a house, and he had a house built on that land. And she never asked him for another dime. Several times over the course of her life, people would, no, lawyers would knock on the door and say, you know, I need you to, you, you need some money, I can get you some money, because you get you some money from your husband, James Brown. She refused. She worked in a factory for 30 years. And when he died, one of the last people he was talking to on the phone was his first wife, Miss Felma. And she was so hurt that, she, that he didn't tell her he was in the hospital because that's the kind of person he was. Those of you who grew up in the South or who have relatives who grew up in the South 
Understand that Southerners, they have a stubborn streak when it comes to honor. They could be bleeding, internally bleeding to death. Well, they would make sure that you ask for a Coca-Cola, you're going to get it <laughs> in a glass on a, one of them things that don't, you know, mar the table, whatever it is. Or, you know. I mean, people from the South are just proud. They don't like you. To, they don't ask for nothing, and they don't want nothing from you. That's just how, and that's, James Brown in many ways much, was much more Southerner. He was as much a Southern as a black man, if not more a Southern than a black man, because everything he did indicates that he, everything he was about came from his Southern upbringing. The sense of pride, the fact that he always was clean. He was never, ever out of place. Not a hair. After his, every performance, he would sit under a hair dryer for three hours and get his hair done. And then he would walk out. And the title of this book, Kill Him and Leave, is something that he told that James Brown told Reverend Sharpton. Reverend Sharpton, Al Sharpton spent 15 years with James Brown. And he talks about it, you know, in this book. And he would tell Reverend Sharpton, you know, come important, leave important. Don't stick around. Kill him and leave. And he would have his band set up so they would hit, dun, 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 dun. and he, you know, the, he would watch the audience and they would be greet. I mean, those of you who know who've seen James, but he would wait until they were just about, I mean, he, the, and his band was spectacular. And they would be, and he would just watch. He would watch. He'd be standing in the side, smoking a cigarette, just calm. And then when they were just primed, greased up until the point of almost bursting, then he would come out and he would just kill him. And then he would leave. <laughs> uh, he was a spectacular showman and he was also a spectacular musician. And I just want to talk a little bit about James Brown's con contribution to American music because most people talk about it. You know, when you hear a writer start to like wax deep about music, you know, my eyes start to roll up in my head because I don't want to hear them. I don't want to hear any fancy talk. What, you know, what did the guy really do? So I'm going to tell you what he really did. The blues. Now, James Brown borrowed a lot from like Louis Jordan. If, you, if you've never heard Louis Jordan, you should, you should get Louis Jordan records because you'll hear what James Brown sounded like in a jazz milieu because Louis Jordan had something, a group called the, the Timpani Five. And during those times, Louis, you had Louis Jordan, you had Count Basie, you had... Um, uh, Duke Ellington, and then you had the kings of swing, you know, Tommy Dorsey. So, I mean, you know, the white guys were the kings and the black guys were the dukes and the count, whatever. <laughs> I don't know how that worked out, but, um, uh, but you know, I mean, Tommy Dorsey and those guys could swing. Everybody swung back in, the, in those days. But what Louis, jo what Louis Jordan did was Louis Jordan played dances. You know, he was, he was, a, he was a, they played dances where people did the, uh, what's that thing where they did the Charleston, you know, they did the Charleston and, and so forth. And James Brown borrowed a lot of his early act from Louis Jordan. But as he moved from his, you know, please, please, please era into uh, the, the, the section of his life, which is known now as soul music or R&B, he, he started out with, this is how the blues goes. The blues goes, I'm just going to, you know, because I can't, I don't have my piano player with me, but you just have to bear with me. The blues is, you know, one chord, two, three, four, one, two, that's the two, one chord, two, three, four, one, and then it goes to the four chord, doo, 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 four chord, then it goes back to the one chord, doo, 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 one, and then it goes to the five chord, doo, 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 then to the four chord, then back to the one chord, then it goes to, to the five, and then the one chord, and then you get your beer, and you say, oh, this is great, and, and that cycle, <laughs> that cycle is known as the 12-bar blues. Now, what James Brown started to do as he moved out of the blues into what is known as rhythm and blues is he started to alternate with the help of his extraordinarily gifted musicians, and I'll talk about them in a minute. He started to alter that form so that he would stay on the one chord and then he would go to the four chord and maybe the fifth or sixth bar. And maybe he would stretch the five chord out and then come back to the one chord and do, do an extra four bars in the one chord and then break and then do the one chord again and do it for nine bars until he what happened was his band learned to shape the music around his lyrics now his his change his you know the he made the big change when you hear the song out of sight out of sight was a blues but the groove was different that's the one chord and he goes again and the one and he goes to the four and now he's back to the one Da, 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 da. It's all right. Now he's at the five. Boom, boom, boom. No, he's out of sight. Five, 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 five. Four, 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 five. And now he's back to the one. Da, da. You got it? So he, he went to the one, but he altered 
the, 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 the bar count so that it fit with his lyric. Now, as he got more and more sophisticated about it, he changed up members of the band, and he brought in Pee Wee Ellis and Fred Wesley. Pee Wee Ellis is a tenor saxophone player. He was from Texas originally, ended up in Rochester, New York. And Pee Wee Ellis ended up, he studied with Sonny Rollins before he got into James Brown's band. So all the great songs, like Cold Sweat, was actually written by Pee Wee Ellis. And if you ever heard Miles Davis, if you hear Cold Sweat, it's boom, ba da boom, boom. It's the same. I mean, he said, Pee Wee said, I got that from Miles. But he also wrote, when you hear Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, you hear this whole business of the sharp nine that you never hear that in pop music. There were many, many different elements of working this counterpoint in James Brown's sound. The other thing that James Brown did early on when he started to move from blues to rhythm and blues or soul was that instead of going to the four chord, he just stayed on the one. So if you hear songs like, uh, like Funky Drummer, where he, you know, they just stay on the one. Funky Drummer, by the way, is, yeah, it is, it's Funky Phone. Funky Drummer is one of the most sampled songs in American history. And the reason why Funky Drummer is an important song for you to know is that because there are two big movements in the R&B genre which change how people listen to soul music. One was by James Brown, and the other one was by the late Grover Washington Jr. The James Brown one is where, you know, drums you, was, was, is sort of like this. The usual blues drum is doom, da 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 And so, the, you know, you, the, your drummer is just banging on two and four. Now, a jazz drummer, you know, he, when jazz drummer plays, his, his, hand, his, right, his left hand is loose, and he, he hits the snare drum every, you know, he's just hitting the snare when he feels like it and he's accenting and so forth. But with James Brown's band, with the with great drummer named Clyde Stubblefield, Clyde Stubblefield grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And he began to, he learned how to play drums by listening to the sound of the railroad train that went outside his window, which went And so what he did was when, he, when, he, when you hear Funky Drummer, You'll hear Clyde Stubblefield's left hand. Now, now, parade band drummers and classical drummers will hold their sticks loose. And that's what Clyde Stubblefield learned how to do, taught himself. So when he was playing, he was playing. This is the left hand doing this. So it sounds like five guys playing. And so James Brown, he auditioned. Four other drummers with Clyde Stubblefield before he, and when he heard Clyde, he had, now he hated Clyde. <laughs> Personally, he hated Clyde. But he, could, but he could dance to Clyde. And that's why Clyde Stubblefield and John Jabo Starks were his drummers. Now he also had a fantastic drummer from this area, uh, area named Mel Parker, who was Maceo Parker's brother. Um, and Mel Parker was an excellent drummer. Um, but it was Clyde Stubblefield who really created, in my opinion, and this is one person's opinion, and, and the opinion of many of James Brown's musicians as well, the ones, the ones who were in his great band, that it was Clyde Stubblefield who really helped create that revolutionary James Brown, James Brown sound, which really revolved around laying a heavy beat on the third bar. So you, James Brown, like if you hear Cold Sweat, how's Cold Sweat? Uh, okay, how's it begin? Okay, yeah. Uh, d uh, what? No. I break out. Oh, yeah. Um, now, how does it begin, though? No. no. Oh, I say, boom. Da. Okay, now here it is. So it's on the, it's on the, on the, if you listen to the heavy downbeat on the first bar of the, thir the first beat of the third bar, so the cold, cold bit goes, and here it comes. Boom. Once again. Boom, and that, that real heavy beat on bar three of his groove became something that you heard, that you still hear in a lot of American music. It was absolutely brand new. Now, the other thing I should point out to you is that there's someone else who had an enormous influence on hip hop and rap music today, and including, I mean, James Brown is the most sampled, funky drummer is the most sampled drum loop ever. But there was another guy who, who isn't given credit for his for his influence on rap music. And he was a jazz music, and that, that was Grover Washington Jr. of Philadelphia.
Because when Grover Washington produced the song, he went to the studio. They were going to do a session with another player named Hank Crawford. And Hank Crawford got sick, and they called Grover Washington in to do the session instead. And he created one song that really became his trademark. It was called Mr. Magic. And Mr. Magic begins like this. Boom, 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 boom. Once upon a time when I was a teenager, before I had a beat, before I had a pe Because that beat up, boom, 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 boom. You hear that everywhere. I, I, I did a session with Grover. I, I wrote a couple songs for him. One, and I, I was in the studio with him. I said, Grover, man, you know. I said, you ever play with James Brown? And he laughed. He said, you kidding? I wasn't funky enough. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I said, well, that, that cancels me out. Then I ain't never going to. <laughs> so those were part of James Brown's musical innovations. He, he, he recorded with Oliver Nelson, who was a great jazz, jazz pioneer, um, uh, arranger. And if you listen to his recording with Oliver Nelson's big band, James Brown just leaves him in the dust. I mean, he's so intense, so powerful. But the other part of James Brown's development and the reason why I say his life is a metaphor for um, where we are in America in terms of race relations and how we deal with each other in terms of looking at people from working class backgrounds and, and how, we look, how we look at the North and how we look at the South is what happened when he died. James Brown died in December 20, 2006. He set up a trust fund and a, a foundation, a trust, so that all of his money, every penny, his likeness, his publishing, his music, everything, would be set up in a trust to educate poor children, black and white. And he was very specific about that. No race, just poverty. Poor children, black and white, in the state of South Carolina and Georgia. Ten years after his death, not a single penny has reached a single kid in either of those states. And the reason is, some of his children sued. The lady who was, he was married to, or supposedly allegedly married to at the end of his life, sued. And the state of South Carolina lives about 50 years behind the rest of the country. You're talking about 48 lawsuits, 4,000 pages of testimony, um, 90 attorneys, most of whom never even knew James Brown. At the end of his life, James Brown's manager was a white Southerner named D Buddy Dallas. And his, his accountant was a white Southerner named David Cannon. And they came into James Brown's life in 1984 when he had been, he was, he was, he was, he was his, his career was in the toilet. He owed the IRS $15 million. Um, he, he, couldn't get a, he couldn't get a record deal that he wanted. He had lost his plane. He lost his radio stations. He was broke. He was, a, he was an oldies act. And those two men, along with a black guy named Judge, uh, Judge Bradley, resurrected his career, brought him all the way back. And when he died, he made those three the trustees of his trustee fund. And when he died, those three were attacked. And, they, and Buddy Dallas, a lawyer, his, his law, law firm nearly collapsed. I mean, he was almost financially ruined. David Cannon, a 68-year-old white guy, a good old boy Republican, went to jail. And his wife tried to commit suicide twice. His son was murdered by two black kids just before he was sentenced. And his ex-wife died rushing to the hospital to, to see about her son when she found about, out about his accident. David Cannon was went to jail and he was a member of the same old boys club that was running, that was milking the dairy cow of James Brown's estate. That's the kind of individuals we're talking about here. And so when I was on the radio today, um, people kept calling and saying, I love James Brown. I saw him in 1965, you know, he was fantastic. And they played some music somewhere else. Said, yeah, James Brown was great, man. I saw him, just, he just changed my life. But nobody called up to say, you know, what happened to this estate that was worth $100 million or so when he died that is now, that, that, his, that the state of Cal South Carolina now administers the state says is worth $4.7 million. What about that? Nobody is speaking about it. The only person who has followed this case from the beginning, ironically, is a 62-year-old white grandmother who works for a small newspaper in Newbury, South Carolina named Sue Summer. She has followed this case. She was, she was a gossip columnist who wrote recipes and local jokes <laughs> in her column, and she heard about a Freedom of Information Act that was uh, being filed in nearby Aiken County or Richland County, and so she went to check it out, and she checked it out, and she followed it, and it turned out to be this James Brown case, and she's the only one that has followed it. They've tried to put her in jail. They've subpoenaed her two or three times. She has gone to jail. She has almost gone to jail three times, twice. She works for a newspaper that is almost bankrupt. And she is the only journalist that has filed this case. For, and, they, and these lawyers 
and these politicians that are milking the James Brown dairy cow, they, they hate her. They can't stand her. And she gets no support. And, you know, years ago, I see Bill Maher, my friend here from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Years ago, a story that smelled this bad, because these men have just kicked this. And, by the way, they're mostly men and mostly graduates of the University of South Carolina. I mean, that's, a, that's not a club there. That is a fortress. And, and they've, had, you know, they've had some fun trying to kick this poor lady around. And you know something? 20 years ago, 25 years ago, a story that smelled this bad with you know, all this money available for these kids and these you know, politicians and lawyers kicking around a sole journalist, that story would have smelled so bad it had wafted clear up to the Philadelphia Inquirer, which was run by a, a southerner named Gene Roberts. And you could throw a rock across the, the Inquirer newsroom and hit four to five of the best reporters you ever saw in your life. And any one of them would have gone down there and pulled out their six-shooter and dropped the hammer in a hurry. And the castle would have teetered and tottered, and then the network would come in and finish the job, and the rats would scurry. But now newspapers don't have the resources they once had. And the public is so busy indulging in cake icing and Donald Trump bullshit that nobody's paying attention to what's really happening. This state government is going wild. You know, the 30% of the kids in, in South Carolina are living below the poverty line. These are the kids we expect to compete with France and Russia and China. I mean, are we just raising them all to go to the army and get their ass shot off in Afghanistan somewhere? I mean, this money is available for the kids. This is what James Brown wanted. If we love this music, why don't we love his, why don't we speak to the issue of where his money's going? The man worked for 40 odd years. And, and a, a, an innocent man went, as far as I'm concerned, this is my own personal opinion, an innocent man went to jail, and his life has been ruined. The only, James Brown trusted no one with his money. The only person he trusted with his money was his accountant. And the accountant went to jail. Now, you know, the, 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 the wife, she says he was, she was his wife, but she was married before she married him and never got divorced. Well, in New York, we call that bigamy, but in South Carolina, <laughs> apparently she, that's not, that doesn't count, so they ruled that she's his wife. I mean, I just don't understand how, you know, this is a good example of how state governments, there needs to be some sort of federal intervention in this kind of case. Because even though I'm not a lawyer, I know that when a will does not hit probate court, it's red meat on the table for anyone who wants to drop a lawsuit. And that's what has happened. Now, the man worked for a long time, and he, had a li he lived a life of desperation, and some of it was not clean. His treatment of women was horrible. He had outside children. He had a drug problem that he developed in mid, mid, middle life because he was despondent because he saw he had outrun his revolution. But at the end of his life, he gave everything he had to help poor people because that's who James Brown really was, and that's how black people always saw him, and that's why they forgave him of the things that he did. Now, the guy left everything, and not a penny has reached anyone, and that's why racism makes a victim of us all. Because this would not happen if he were Elvis Presley or John Lennon. It just would not happen. I'm sorry. Now, the problem with me doing a book like this is that I'm not the kind of person that likes to talk like this. You know, I took this book. You know, I'm a happy guy. You know, I'm a mother's wife. What's, you know, let's, let's, why don't we love each other? You know. But, you know, once you get in bed and take your clothes off, you might as well finish the job. I mean, when I got this, you know, when I took this on, really. <laughs> It's not the best metaphor to use, but you get the idea. <laughs> but you know, when I when I <laughs> you know when I took this on, I didn't realize when I realized what I was getting into. I thought I would just write about, you know, just I, I just didn't realize how complicated the story was. And the only reason why I'm in the story is because I because the editor of this book was the editor of The Color of Water, Cindy Spiegel, and Cindy Spiegel created The Color of Water, really, and she. This magnificently gifted editor, and she said, you, if you want to make a book that's going to have some resonance and be different and people will read, you have to put yourself in it. So I did. Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's my story, pretty much. The book visits, you know, Charles Bobbitt, who is, is right now is really sick. James Brown's probably the last, of, one of the last people who knew him for 41 years. It, we visit Miss Emma Austin, who was his best friend's wife and who knew him, Mr. Brown until he died as well. We visit Miss, Miss, uh, Miss Velma Brown, who was his first wife, who's never given an interview. And we also talked to Reverend Al Sharpton. And, uh, and, and remember, when Al Sharpton was 17, he was friends with James Brown's son, Teddy. Teddy died in an automobile accident when he was like 19. And um, 
Charles Bob, I mean, uh, um, as a result of that, Reverend Al Sharpton met James Brown in the 70s. And he went on the road. He left New York at 17 with James Brown, and he was Al Sharpton, the boy wonder preacher. He returned 15 years later as Al, Reverend Al Sharpton, the hellraiser, you know, the, the torturer of New York, you know, <laughs> high society. <laughs> and when you hear Reverend Sharpton speak, whether you like him or not, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not his spokesman, and I'm not, you know, when you hear him speak, you're really hearing James Brown talk because he loved the Rev. He was crazy about the Rev, and he kind of adopted the, and Reverend Sharp didn't even call James Brown his father. And when James Brown died, two things to, to remember. When he died, I said, I covered Michael Jackson during the 1984 Victory Tour, and Reverend Sharpton was on that tour, but I couldn't ever talk to him because he was, but I was a reporter. I couldn't, like, hang out with that guy. And, and also the Jacksons hated me, you know. They had never, well, see, the Jacksons thought People Magazine was racist and they hated the magazine. And when I showed up, they'd never seen a black reporter from People Magazine before. And they just tagged me as an Uncle Tom and they didn't speak to me for months. And that was, so I never really, I mean, only later on did, did they, you know, they, they sort of respected me, but they never, never liked me, which is fine. I'm not there to be liked. Um, but I always respected and admired uh, Michael Jackson and his mother and his family. I, the Jacksons are very nice people. And so when, but I mentioned that because when I was on that tour, Reverend Sharpton and Don King and a bunch of other really interesting characters <laughs> were on that tour for six months. And, um, and Sharpton used to say on that tour all the time, he says, I'm here because James Brown sent me. James Brown sent me to look after Michael Jackson's interests. <laughs> now, you know, he's saying this at a press conference and you're sitting there writing down, you're like, this is bull <laughs> shit. <laughs> okay, okay. You know. <laughs> but, you know, you, what are you going to say? You just, you know. You, but it turned out to be true. And when James Brown, many years later, Michael Jackson will return that favor. And I write about it in the book. He goes, when James Brown died, he was in an Augusta funeral home. And around 1130 midnight, a van pulls up. Four bodyguards get out. Michael Jackson walks out, and he spent the night over James Brown's body, fixing his hair, combing his hair. And he, he was there for five hours. He never sat down. And the next day at James Brown's funeral, he was the only major celebrity to show, to show up. He really idolized James Brown. In many ways, they were a lot alike. They were deeply misunderstood. They had had deep problems, um, but ultimately were very, very... Um, very generous in terms of their giving to charity and, and, and very, very lonely. Um, I was going to say something else about James Brown, but I forgot it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's my story, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm sticking with it. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain you. Is Maceo? Yeah, Maceo Park is still alive. Yeah, Maceo Parker does. He's he's alive and he's touring. Um, no, Maceo wouldn't. Talk. Well, um, no, he Maceo didn't want to talk to me, uh, and I I queried him several different times. But I understand why, and I I really don't blame him. You know, Maceo stayed with James Brown a long time, long after Fred Wesley and the others left. Um, you know, he had, he just had a you know a love hate relationship with James Brown. James Brown wasn't always that kind to Maceo Parker. Uh on the other hand, you know, uh Maceo's career is based on what James Brown taught him and did for him. Um and the other part of this is you know, on the business tip, Fred Wesley and Pee Wee Ellis were the ones who wrote a lot of Maceo was a great Maceo does more with six Maceo Parker does more with six notes than most saxophonists do with you know twelve. But he, he's not a composer. He's not known as a composer. It was Fred Wesley and, and, and Pee Wee Ellis who shaped the band and, and made, the, made the James Brown sound. Maceo was part of that. But these guys were the musical directors and the composers. And, and so they, they made more from it in terms of their royalties sitting home than Maceo did. Maceo, you know, when you write a song, you make money sitting home. When you're a performer, you got to get in the bus or and fly. And, and, and so Maceo always has to work. I mean... I'm not speaking for you. Maybe he doesn't have to work. Maybe he's a millionaire living at home, but I doubt it. So, so I never spoke to him though. I mean, I, I you know, I, um, 
he, his manager called me. You know, he, they were handing me some some bullshit. So I said, I'm not interested. I don't need to talk. To I mean, I, I know how painful it is. His manager called me and said, you know, she emailed me and said, you know, what do you want? I, I had already sent him the books and told him what I wanted to do. But m I have the Harry Benson approach to dealing with celebrities. Harry Benson is like a famous photographer who I met when I was on the Jackson tour. And when Harry Benson would show up to take a picture, you know, the celebrities would always like do it. And I asked him one day, I said, how, did you, how do you make them show up? And Harry Benson said, you know, he was a British dude. He says, I never wait. <laughs> he said, I never wait, I just leave. And I come back. You know, so what he would do, he would leave. He'd say, okay, well, I'll come back another time. And he would do that two or, th and two or three times. And if they didn't show up, he would just say, okay, forget it. And so that's, that's, that was kind of my approach with, with Maceo and in general with folks, you know, in the James Brown. And look, you know this well. I mean, having been a reporter for, you know, many years if you go out to interview someone and they're not they don't want to show up they don't want to do it or they're funky you know you just you leave you say i'll come back in five minutes or you just don't do it Bye. yeah see you later have a nice day i mean you know the post is coming out tomorrow anyway you can believe that buddy <laughs> take that buddy anyway <laughs> yes uh hi um watching video of uh james brown performances you often see the thing well, i don't know about often but sometimes you would see him just become completely overcome and they would sometimes put the cape on him and escort him off. I mean, uh, what's the story behind that part of his performance? Well, he said he got it from a wrestler named Gorgeous George, <laughs> you know? I, I'm not sure, I mean, I had seen, I, I visited the United House of Prayer where James Brown was when he visited when he was young and the United House of Prayer, they, they, which, which is an apolistic church, they call it, Pentecostal church, you know, with Daddy Grace, for those of you who are a little older, remember Daddy, uh, Daddy Grace was probably here. I mean, the Father Divine was in Philly and New York. Well, Daddy Grace was a big preacher, and his, one of his big churches was in Augusta, Georgia. If you can, go to, you can go to Daddy Grace's church now, today, and hear the James Brown sound. Lots of horns. They have a, a shout chorus. There's a, the choir has a certain name. They call it like the... The mar it's, they have a name, it's a shout band, but there's a name, I can't recall it. Um, so I, th I think that he might have gotten that, that, that thing from Gorgeous George the Wrestler, but I have a feeling that, some, that it might have been rooted in, in his experience at the United House of Prayer in, in Augusta, Georgia, Cause, because Daddy Grace was a, you know, they would go wild and then they, you know, they put the cape on him and then, you know, and then the spirit would hit him and then put the cape and, and so forth. But it was just a routine after a while. At one point it was real, but then it became a routine. I mean, he was like a writer, a book, you know, book, a writer on, a book writer on tour. It's just, you know, <laughs> you hit the numbers, you know what they're going to say. You, know. you cry, you say, oh, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Aaron. Um, I'm going to be a student at NYU. I hope you're still a writer in residence there when I get there. Yes, I, 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 I hope so. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Me too. Um, so, so many of like the great writers and orators on race in America, I feel like they help us remember um, so much of like what we do around race is like actively forgetting the history of whether it's slavery or Jim Crow and telling narratives that kind of flatter us as a country. And writers like James Baldwin, like they help us see, you know, uh, what we were trying to forget or even ta Coates, right? Like helping awake us from that dream. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, James Brown does that with his, his music? Well, yeah, I think he's representative of that, you know. I think his music is, is um, I think his music really is beyond race. I mean, it's unfortunate we always have these discussions around race, you know. But until we learn how to talk about it in, 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 in sort of the proper way, uh, with a kind of honesty and, and clarity, we'll always have these kinds of discussions. But I think the answer to the question is yes. Cool. All right, good luck. Yes, sir. Now, people often ask me, uh, what's the greatest musical event I ever witnessed? And I was 14 years old. I snuck out of my house. I grew up about a mile from here. Got on a bus and went to the Howard Theater for the midnight show of James Brown at the Howard Theater. And it was unbelievable. Two hours. I couldn't believe his energy. And I have a little story about the cape. I was virtually at the start of the show I couldn't get a seat it was a sellout so I I kind of snuck up to the front and I saw the cape come out and that means the show's ending 
and his manager had a stick in his hand like a billy club. And these women were charging James and trying to drag him off the stage. <laughs> and, he, and I said, that guy's going to get in trouble. He's got a stick. He's going to hit somebody. Anyway, the, there was this one woman. She was very persistent, and she had a big, thick wig on. And this manager just whooped her upside the head. Mm. And she charged back at James. And he hit her again. And he knew how to hit people. Because there was no blood. And that wig did his job. But James got out of there real fast. Because he, he sensed the crowd was, uh, they were cannibals. Mm. And, this, and, and I once saw the same phenomena with Elvis Presley. And, and I always thought James Brown was Michael Jackson before there was a Michael Jackson. Yeah. And James funny. was a great, great performer. And anybody who can make you dance with every song has a special energy. And that's a special energy from Africa. Every African country has its dances. And I think that helps the music a lot. Yeah. You know? yeah. But it was a great show. Never forgot it. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, well, two more questions. That's it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. McBride, first of all, for this book. I uh, couldn't put it down. I teach at Howard. And in fact, uh, we read passages from the book in a class I'm teaching on hip hop. And you, as you may or may not know, Chadwick Boseman went to Howard, who played, of course, James Brown. Right. When you talk about Get On Up being 40% false, uh, that struck a resonant chord in, among these black students who were talking about the question of fame and, and more importantly, the silences. My question, really, could you speak a little bit about, as you write early in the text, about the silences that race creates? I'm a Southerner myself, and that struck a resonant chord with me. The idea that people are in public spaces having conversations that aren't fake, but at the same time, you rarely hear black people speak their mind. And the other piece, if you could spend a second on it, sure. get into the Mick Jagger piece, because I want to understand what Mick Jagger's thing is with James Brown to do that. Was he just deceived, or, or was this something else at play? Thank you, man. All right. Well, um, the first part of the book, I talk about the movie Get On Up, which, you know, I, when I was flying to Europe, we were touring there earlier this year, and I saw it on the plane, which means it's over in Europe, and it means everybody sees it. And I think Get On Up is about 40% fiction. And I think biopics by nature have problems, you know, because they don't, you know, they don't have a lot of time. They don't have a lot of st time to delineate character. But some of the worst parts of Get On Up are, are begin at, start at the very beginning, where James Brown goes into a room full of people, that are in his office, and he, you know, he, he starts yelling at him. He says, you know, who did a number two in my commode? Who hung a number two in my commode? James Brown would never speak that. He would never say, oh, shit, and all. He, would ne he never cursed. Charles Bobbitt and said, I knew James Brown for 41 years. He never cursed. The original script of Get On Up, by the way, was full of MF words and all this other nonsense. He never fired a gun into the ceiling. He walked in there with a gun that didn't even have a firing pin in it. He set it in the corner. He asked the people not to use his bathroom. He said, thank you very much, took the gun, left. And then this so-called high-speed chase was not a high-speed chase at all. It was the cops running behind him. He was trying to get to his father who was in the hospital. It was pitiful. And then they, did, they shot into his car like some 17 odd times, including twice into the gas tank. And then when they took him to the police station, he, he told the FBI that one of them punched him in the mouth, knocked out one of his teeth. Now that's what really happened. But in the movie, you know, they just play it as, you know, it's all fun and games. It's just R&B. It's in the South. You, you know, you, there's no fact checking. What, who cares? Everyone gets, makes money. The music that they chose was music that they carefully chose that was that were carefully chose because my, my guess would be that there was some rights issues in some of his really good music because Get Up Off of That Thing was not one of James Brown's greatest songs. That was one of his weakest songs. But you notice, the, see who the writers of the songs are. The writers of that song are his three daughters who, by the way, sued him for royalties for songs they, they must have written when they were six and seven years old because he used them. He put their names as writers of a song as a tax dodge, and they later sued him. And according to Buddy Dallas, his manager, he never, he never forgot that. So you're talking about some really personal family stuff that's deeply, you know, deeply, was deeply hurt the man, and it's played out and exploited so that someone in Hollywood can make a fatter percentage. In terms of the silences that this professor from Howard talked about, when Hollywood moves to... Do, first, Spike Lee was supposed to do the James Brown movie. Now, whether you like Spike Lee or not, 
Spike Lee does. He he will he will he will pull out the bullet, pull out the gun, drop the hammer, and tell the bullet to hurry when it comes to defending his work. Now I don't always agree with Spike <laughs> with a lot of stuff he does, but he certainly is qualified to understand where James Brown was coming from. I don't know that the the the, the screenwriter for this particular piece, who also wrote The Help, I mean the director who directed this, also directed The Help. Now you can ask some of the, the African Americans in this room how they feel about African American life constantly being depicted by white people. I mean, how many, I mean, aren't there any Mexican directors in Hollywood? Are there some Chinese directors, please? Any black directors in Hollywood who can do this kind of work? I mean, the issue really boils to how do we want to be want to see ourselves i listen i am not you know as, as as richard nixon said i am not a racist you know i'm not a racist person <laughs> but when you're telling someone's story you have to learn as a writer to look the first person they asked to do this story when the guy asked me to do the james brown story i said i'm not the guy you want i you should jerry hershey is the person you want jerry hershey is a white writer who's been writing about soul music back when i was smoking weed you know on 120 fish i mean she jerry jerry is the best i mean james brown liked her and the guy said no i want a black writer to do this and that's when i should have just taken my raggedy little notebook and hustled on out down the road because this was a white guy talking and i said you know i should have just smelled the rat but i didn't so i ended up falling into the abyss of race when i'm <laughs> telling you about the great silences that exist in racism we've just got to understand that everybody deserves a chance to be fully dimensional on screen. And then unless we learn that in the South, for example, everybody has to stay in their own lane. That's it. Everyone knows their place. James Brown veered out of that lane badly from time to time. Sometimes it was his fault and sometimes it wasn't. But whenever he did, he was marshaled back into it. The marshaling of him into the lane where he was supposed to belong is damaging to all of us. That's why these kids in South Carolina are not receiving that scholarship money. Final last question, sir. Your talk was absolutely amazing and absolutely wonderful, and I'm glad it debunked the movie. And for anybody that likes the Rolling Stones like I do, I don't know why Mick Jagger came out and just, he must have made a ton of bling because of that film. But having said that, when you talked about the lane, what ja lane was James Brown in when he did that incredible concert in my hometown in 1968 when I was still in high school to save the rioting from Boston when Dr. King was killed? Could you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, that was a very interesting. There's a movie about that, I believe. Um, he, James Brown didn't believe in violence. And he talked about, you know, in 1968 when, when Martin Luther King was, was killed, Boston was about to break out into riots, and James Brown had a concert schedule. And what the, the, city, the city fathers of Boston wisely decided to televise the concert. And in doing so, James Brown made it, did a tremendous performance. And then during the concert, there was almost a riot when a kid jumped on stage and started to dance with James Brown. And all these people came on stage, and James Brown and the cops converged on the stage, and then James Brown asked the cops to leave. And then he convinced the kids to go back into the audience. He said, you're making fools of yourself. You know, what does the white man have to worry about when you're making fools of yourself? I can't, I'm just paraphrasing. And they went back into the audience, and he sang, and he danced, and he, he diffused the violence, because he didn't really believe in violence. He believed in the system. And he did the same in Washington, D.C. He was also called here to quell the, dis the disturbance here, and also in Augusta, Georgia. Listen, at the end of his life, what he really wanted, he wanted he and what he truly believed, was he wanted peace between white and black people, people of all types. He'd seen the world, and he'd seen that everybody in the world wants the same thing. The Chinese mom wants the same thing as the Japanese mom, the same thing as the mom from Afghanistan, the same thing as the mom from Washington, D.C. They just want to live in a nice house. They want, they want peace. They want a little bit of love. They want the same thing. And so at the end of his life, that's what he tried to do, and that's what that concert in Boston was all about. So I ask you to remember that when I get arrested in South Carolina. I want you to remember <laughs> me. Make sure you <laughs> write letters. Of, you got me in a jail with Bubba. Just make sure that it's a nice jail and it's, and it's air-conditioned. And uh, uh, thank you for coming out, and good luck. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind folding up your chairs, uh, we have plenty of copies of the book up front. Please. Uh